three, two, one. Here we go. Welcome to the Remote Photography Podcast. In this episode, I speak with model Angel Black about remote photography experiences. Enjoy the podcast. Hi, Angel. Thanks for doing the podcast. If uh, people don't know who you are, can you give a brief introduction of your career as a model? I can. So, hi. Thank you for having me. I'm Angel, Angel Black, and I have been a model today, actually, marks my four-year anniversary Uh since starting. That was a bit of timing. (laughs) It was, yeah. So, how did you find out about remote shooting? Was it through the Facebook groups, or you just saw people starting to do it? Uh, Yeah, so I originally saw it through Purple Board, actually. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, Because I didn't used to have a Facebook account, like a modelling one. And then I spoke to a friend who um, was remote shooting. I saw kind of her success. Um, And we kind of just started chit-chatting about it. She explained the setup that she had. And she actually was the first person to help me um, start with the remote shoot. She gave me all the advice for uh, the tethering software to use, mm-hmm. which I later changed after um, <laughs> Experiment. after some unfortunate, um, yeah. uh, what's the word? Um, experiences? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, had lots of issues with that yeah. one. Uh, and then I started joining Facebook. Um, she mentioned a couple of Facebook groups. I joined them all mm-hmm. and it snowballed from there, really. Cool. And um, I see you did something called e-shoots. Was that before you started remote or was it something you did concurrent with remote shoots? It's something um, we started before. So mm-hmm. um, myself and my partner, John, um, J Black Photographic, mm-hmm. we started them last I think it was last January. It was it was a little bit before uh, the lockdown, but yeah. they really, really took off during March, obviously, during mm-hmm. the first lockdown. Yeah. Um, and basically what we did there was we advertised being, you know, a model and photographer couple living in the same household. Mm-hmm. We were able to still create images mm-hmm. from our home studio base and allow photographers who'd maybe run out of their backlog yeah. of images that they were editing. We, we were able to provide them with images to edit um, they could send us, a, you know, a mood board and we could make it as precise as they wanted or they could give us free reign and we could just produce a set amount of images that they'd asked for. And it kind of just, you know, that's kind of how it worked. Yeah. It was just mainly for editing purposes, really. But that was kind of like a little dip in your toe into kind of remote shooting because you, you obviously you were getting a brief from the photographer and then shooting to their brief. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, we didn't have the photographer connected with us at Mm. the time. Myself and John would just kind of get on with it and then provide them with the images. But the whole concept of providing the raw files at the end of a shoot, um, using a either Dropbox or WeTransfer or, you know, one of those kinds Mm. of services to provide the images at the end. So I kind of had a a vague understanding of of how to communicate with a photographer prior to actually not physically working with them, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that that helped a lot, I think. Yeah, and it was a lot of a it was a bit of a confidence boost as well, yeah. um, because it was, like I say, I knew how to already go about arranging the shoot before I started the remote shoots. Yeah. So obviously, with the e shoots behind you, you moved on to doing remotes. Was that like as soon as like the first lockdown happened, or was it something you just waited to see if it was going to be a few weeks and then everything would be back to normal? No, I think I already knew that it was going to be a long haul mm-hmm. um, with the with COVID. So when we first started the e-shoots back in uh, January, and then they kind of took off really in mm-hmm. um, March into May kind of thing, I used I was having I had a Chromebook at the time, mm-hmm. um, which I realized was not compatible with any tethering software. So I did actually try remote starting to do remote shooting. Uh, you know, prior to mm-hmm. when I actually took it up this year. So after realizing that my software that my computer, sorry, wasn't uh, going to be compatible with any of my software. Yeah. I then realized I was going to have to invest in a new laptop, which I wasn't a big fan of doing. Yeah. However, I don't know. I, don't, I really don't know what took me so long. Yeah. But in August of last year, I got a new one for university purposes. Mm-hmm. Um, I ended up with the Microsoft Surface Pro, which is pretty much a PC, but in a laptop form. Yeah. So it is capable of handling pretty much any tethering software out there. Mm-hmm. But it really wasn't until January of this year, of 2021, that I really connected the dots. Oh, and okay. I realized I could have done remote shoots back last August. Yeah. So I'm not really sure what happened there. I, I just didn't seem to be able to connect two and two together. <laughs> so obviously from doing remote shoots from January of this year, um, whereabouts in the world have you had photographers like call in from? 
Oh, all over the place. Mm -hmm. I've done America. That's mm -hmm. there's a really, really big kind of demand from there. Yeah. I've done Belgium. I've done where else have I done? France. I've done Scotland as well. I've done a couple in um Ireland, mm -hmm. uh Switzerland. I've done Helsinki. I've done quite a few places yeah. actually. Did you find it was the more the overseas photographers that kind of approached you first or was it the UK photographers? I think it was a mix of both at the beginning um, and then the UK photographers obviously as we came out of lockdowns and we were able to have a little bit more freedom I think a lot of the British photographers began shooting at, in person but yeah. with local models to start with and then the, the, the real demand definitely came from overseas I would definitely say I mean for me personally mm -hmm. I think my biggest demand is most definitely the US I've hosted myself and John have hosted a, a couple of studio days with other models in our studio um, which have sold out but both you know all the bookings came specifically from America so obviously with your partner am I correct thinking being a photographer you kind of had the setup already so what's the current setup you have to do remotes yeah, so um, he is a photographer, yeah. So he had quite a lot of the equipment already. Mm -hmm. And then he decided to invest in a second camera, which was going to be his main shooting camera. So his kind of backup camera became my one. So I use a Nikon D750 um, camera and I've got a selection of lenses. So I've got a 50 um, Nikon 1.8 lens, the Sigma R85 1.4, the Nikon um, kit lens, the 24 to 120, and then the 35 Sigma Art lens 1.4 as well. Although I tend to use mostly the 35 in um, my main shooting area, which tends to be the glass room. So I've definitely noticed that I have quite a big demand for natural light. Yeah. Um, I have two rooms specifically, which are very, very um, naturally lit. And then for the studio portion, I have full Elinchrom strobes. I've got a couple, I think I've got three Nikon SB700 speed lights. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a couple of Godox lights as well, a V1. And then a bunch of different soft boxes with grids and then some kind of uh, snuds, some beauty dishes, mm -hmm. reflectors, barn doors, I've got gels, pretty much anything you can imagine you'd find in a, a physical studio you yeah. could go to, I guess. So it was it was really just the laptop was the the bit the bit at the beginning that was a stumbling block. Yeah, I I just like I say, mm. although I had the the laptop back in August, mm -hmm. I just did not connect the dots sooner um, that I could have started last year. So that was the only thing that was stopping me. Like I say, because being a Chromebook, uh, yeah. um, internet based. So how did you first do like the remote shots? Was it through Zoom or through a different app? It's always been through Zoom. It's yeah, been, yeah, I've not used any other software. Mm. Have you had any issues or is it you've, you've always stuck to Zoom because it's been there for you? Yeah, no, I've never had any issues with Zoom. The only thing I did have issues with, like I briefly touched on, mm -hmm. was my tethering software. I was originally using Digicam controls and it just became, I think with the demand and the amount that I was using it, mm -hmm. I think I started noticing that the glitchy-ness of it just became too too bad to the point where sometimes I'd have to cancel shoots I wasn't able to even launch the system sometimes right. so I switched over to capture one which is you know you pay for that yep. um as a, as a software mm. but it definitely does a, a hundred times better job mm. I haven't had a single glitch at all I don't think since I've started using that obviously with the Nikon I know there's been a few models that have had Nikon's an issue with the software how did you find using capture one and like telling the, the photographers how to use it Pretty easy, actually. Um, I've got, I think I've got it down to an art now, to be honest. <laughs> I've described it to people that many times. Yeah. But I even had to, the other day, John was hosting a studio day from our studio and I was already booked elsewhere, so I wasn't going to be here. Mm -hmm. So I actually described it to John and had to, you know, show him the ropes and how to yes. use the software. And then he had to explain it to the other mm -hmm. photographers. So I think if I'm able to teach someone who can then teach other people, I don't think I did a pretty bad job. <laughs> It sounds like you don't even need to be in front of the computer. You've literally got it memorised. So. I have, mm. pretty much. It's probably a bad thing, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, how, how many remotes have you done? And like, It does have to be an exact figure, like a ballpark figure. Um, probably over 100 now. Wow. Um, I've done I've done loads. And like yeah. I say, I've only done it since, been doing it since um, January. Yeah. So, That's yeah, in eight a months. Yeah, it, yeah it, it really, really yeah. uh, quite a lot. But I mean, doing it using um, my system, mm -hmm. we've done more than 100. As I say, we've had a couple of models now who've mm. shot remotely from our studio using, you know, my laptop and the mm. equipment we have here. Yeah. Me personally, over 100, but, mm. you know, a, a couple more than that um, altogether as well. 
Did you find the limitations of remote shooting like a hindrance at the beginning, or did you find it more like a, oh, I'm going to be creative and use different lenses and different lighting and such? I didn't find it a hindrance at all, actually. I think, in a way, I kind of preferred remote shooting, mm -hmm. not for any, you know, not for any specific reasons of, as you know, such as not seeing the photographer or anything like that. No, yeah. that was that was never the the good thing for me. But I really enjoyed seeing myself, and I really liked being able to frame myself mm -hmm. properly. Um, and I definitely found that there was a much higher proportion of images that were kept compared to yeah. ones that you would throw away mm -hmm. ordinarily. So, and yeah, I definitely did experiment with. Um, with light and natural light as well. And we also hosted a couple of kind of little mini events, so to mm -hmm. speak. Um, so we did a couple of newspaper remote shoots. We did some cloud ones when obviously, obviously the theme of those was, mm -hmm. you know, the first one being newspaper, the second being clouds. And they did really, really well. People were really interested because mm -hmm. it was like a short burst of uh, images that yeah, they could yeah. get um, in a short period of time. And then I think I was also lucky in the fact that, you know, having a photographer live with me mm -hmm. meant that, I could offer the addition of having an assistant on hand. Yeah. Um, and not only was he just any old assistant, you know, he actually has photographic knowledge. Yeah. So he was more than capable of understanding photographic terms mm. in a way that I possibly might not have understood mm -hmm. precisely. So we did, there was a big demand as well um, during the third lockdown, obviously at the beginning of this year, there was a big mm. demand for John when I first started advertising assisted shoots because people realized that they could have someone there to move the camera specifically yeah. as they directed whilst I stayed in the shop. Yeah, because I think a lot of models like suddenly realized a lot of the work that the photographer used to do in person had moved over to them, because especially if they're by themselves, they're getting up, moving the camera, moving the lights and stuff. Whereas you, exactly. you, 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 you were lucky that you had a partner that literally could do that and you could focus on the, the photographer that was doing the remote shoot. Yeah, exactly. I was able to give the the photographer my kind of undivided attention. Mm -hmm. You know, when you start getting up and having to move things, it's often easy to get distracted when you're focusing on doing something else. And mm -hmm. then you kind of don't talk to the photographer quite as much. Yeah. Um, and I, that was a real big thing for me. I really didn't want the communication to um, dither at all. Mm -hmm. I really wanted it to be strong. The connection there, you know, that's all they had. The, the only way you can really make sure a, a remote shoot is successful is to have really good communication. So it was always, you know, a really, mm. really big deal to me um, to have John there to do stuff. And I think photographers appreciated it quite a lot as well, mm. knowing that they could speak in a way that they would normally normally speak to, say, a studio owner. Mm. And the studio owner would know what they wanted and they'd be able to do that. Because mm. you just talked about communication. How do you like a photographer to present their ideas? Is it through like mood boards or just through an email? Yeah, in a way, I, I've got so I have I've got photographers who are very precise and they'll approach me and they'll say, look, this is what I want to do. Here's a mood board or, you know, here's the equipment I want to use. What mm -hmm. can you do with that? Um, and when it comes to anything light wise, like using um, any of the uh, studio lights, I'll always um, ask John, show mm -hmm. John, and then he'll tell me what is and isn't possible. I will then relay, relay that back mm -hmm. and we go from there. But I would also say I get a considerable amount of photographers who just kind of approach me and they go, hey, mm -hmm. I want to shoot. I also want to have a go at remote shoots, but I don't have an idea. Can yeah. you assist? Yeah. And I've kind of collected a bunch of images that have been shot here mm -hmm. uh, either remotely or by John or in person shoots or you know however they've they've come about they've been shot in this in this area in my space mm -hmm. and then I will send them all over at once and they are broken down into three areas so I've got the studio I've got the glass room and I've got the boudoir room mm -hmm. and then out of those three areas I say to the photographers uh, depending on how long they've booked, I say, you know, you've got probably approximately two to four sets that we can get through. Mm -hmm. If you go through all those images and if you, I tend to do it over Instagram or Facebook, mm -hmm. um, just because Purple Paw, you can't really like an image. Yeah. Whereas on Instagram and Facebook, you can, you can like an individual image mm -hmm. that has been sent in a private message. So I will then send them to the photographers and I'll say, look, like the ones that you would like to recreate and mm -hmm. or the areas you'd like to use mm -hmm. and then I go from there and then I go right okay so you've liked this one and this one mm -hmm. so those were shot in the exact same area but with a different setup and then we go from there and we, we were able to go okay brilliant you know we've got our four setups sometimes we'll even choose a couple of extras just in case we have an extra a yeah, bit of extra yeah. time at the end so yeah I think probably the vast majority of of the images that I do 
tend to be from my own inspiration that I've sent to photographers rather than the other way around. Okay. So apart from, say, like the themed ones, like you said, the clouds and the newspaper, it's usually that you say you, you send them some images and they'll like the ones that you've sent and then you can mould the shoot around that. Yeah, they, they can decide on, mm. um, obviously, the styling of the of the shoot. Mm. But it's not it's not about the actual image. It's about the location of mm. that image, if mm. that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So if I'm standing against a white um, sheer, that is part of um, my backlit images. But yeah. I tend to do mostly backlit with natural light. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily about that specific image it's literally just to say here is an image an example of backlight mm -hmm. do you want to do backlight and if they say yes yeah. then we can kind of decide the outfits we want to do there or um you know any of the styling any hair makeup everything like that but now you've taken remote shooting outside the house because you've done one like on a beach or rocks am i right in thinking yes yeah, yeah. I've, I've hosted a couple outside actually yeah. um so the what we tend to do is we tend to check that the connection on your phone, so the mm -hmm. data has to be good. Mm -hmm. um, and as long as there's good data, then mm -hmm. I can tether my laptop. And with my laptop, I can get about two hours um, cool. yeah. battery out of it without needing an external pack. Mm -hmm. So I just tend to do short bursts like that. I've been very lucky because, again, that's probably not something I would have attempted solo yeah. um i don't yeah. think if i was by myself yeah, walking, would... walking on the beach with like a laptop and a camera and yeah yeah um and obviously being a being a rocky beach it mm. was very unstable ground so it was something they definitely needed an assistant for mm. but there's i think there was demand for it because again it's you know and i i think it's important to mention as well that um so with that one for example with the location one we mm -hmm. did um, although the rate was um, significantly higher than if it was to be just an inside my studio yeah. um, one, the again, the vast majority of the photographers that booked onto that event were from different countries. Mm -hmm. Again, I think the vast majority was actually American. Yeah. And I have noticed significantly that American models charge an awful lot more than British models. Mm -hmm. And I think remote shootings really enabled Americans more so, I guess, mm -hmm. the opportunity to work at a cost that's a bit more cost effective for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I totally get it because with, with the um, exchange rate and stuff, it sometimes does become cost effective if they do like, our, our, sorry, our European rates to their US dollar, it, 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 they're like doing it dirt cheap than if it's the other way around. But well, apart from the Rocky Beach, you've done recently a hot tub one. What, am I right in thinking that? Yeah, we have a um, recently, it's a recent acquisition actually, yeah. um, which we invested in mostly for ourselves. <laughs> um, but um, John has a bit of an obsession with lights. Um, okay. And by, by a little obsession, I mean pretty big obsession. My Wait, entire he's, a, he's a photographer, yeah, so he's going to be obsessed with lights. Yeah, but <laughs> so it's also LED lights. It's every light possible. <laughs> so um, we started with the hot tub we've now got so the actual tub that we've got has led strips around the bottom we've also got fairy lights in the gazebo above and then he's also got floodlights which <laughs> in the backdrop <laughs> they're just it, they were all color changing and you can all you can program them so yeah. that all the lights are the same yeah. color but we like to call it our blue lagoon because in the evening we kind of set it when it's you know dark we set yeah. it to a nice kind of aqua blue color and mm -hmm. it's so so pretty yeah, I've done a couple of, of shoots in it so far. I actually did a, an entire day, pretty much, <laughs> where we just shot in the hot tub alone. Um, and I think people really like that as well, mostly because it's just a little bit different. Mm -hmm. It's not something that everyone's got. Yeah, so, it, yeah, that was nice. Yeah, it, it's Exactly. It's like, say, the, the beach and the hot tub. It's different from just having, like, a, a backdrop or, like, a curtains or whatever. So it's like you're giving um, photographers different options. Yeah, definitely. It's the same for um, tours. So mm -hmm. when we were able to start touring again, um, and I, you know, took back to the road again, we decided that we weren't going to stop remote shoots. I know a couple of models, including the the model that actually first helped me get started. Yeah. She'd stopped remote shoots because she was finding it too much pressure, mm -hmm. uh, so to speak, because she was doing it solo. Mm -hmm. But I guess because we already had all the equipment being mm -hmm. it it you know being at john's mm -hmm. i didn't have to worry about it, it going out of fashion so to speak yeah, yeah. because john was always going to make use of it so when we go on tour now i'm able to offer up slots to photographers in you know remotely different yeah. countries or whatever and that's been doing really well as well because again it's a nice location mm -hmm. it's different so i definitely have had quite a few repeat bookings yeah from photographers who've gone, oh, I really enjoyed working with you. Mm -hmm. 
and now you've got somewhere even you know even di- more different to shoot in mm-hmm. and i think it just goes from there really do you find it's something you're gonna continue offering photographers so say like you have a studio day or you go to a wherever you're touring do you think it's something you'll offer now or is it something that once we're back to shooting in person full-time safely that you'll go okay that was a thing and now it's moving moving on no i i think i'll stick to doing it it won't be obviously my main focus my main focus will be when i go away on tour it will be to give it you know first priority will go to um photographers who i've shot with in person before Mm -hmm. um such as my mailing list they'll get first priority yeah um, but I do actually have photographers that I've worked with remotely who are also on my mailing list mm-hmm. because they've said, you know, I enjoyed this property that we worked at. I would be interested in any future tours and or events that you do. And again, being being a remote shoot, they have no restrictions. They don't have to worry yeah. about if they can get to that location in England because, you know, they can sit at their computer <laughs> yeah, desks. Yeah. So I, I do have a bit of a mixed bag now. Mm. I definitely would say, obviously, it's still more in person. Yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. Um, but no, it's something I'll definitely continue to mm. offer. I don't really see the point in not offering it because I don't think it's going to die off entirely. I mm. think it's definitely going to subside, mm-hmm. and it has subsided, um, but there is still a demand for it. You just have to have that little, that niche, you know, yeah, you need to yeah. find where that niche is and you need to really be able to harness it. Yeah, because if, if it's a revenue stream that's come out of the pandemic, you're not going to just go, oh, I'm not going to do it now because it's something that even if it, say, pays for the studio or something you're at, then that's a bit more better for you because then you can focus on the in-person people because you know the studio has been paid for by the remote or something like that. Exactly. Um, we're actually hosting a myself and another model um, mm. that I've worked with in person before. Mm. Um, we hosted a duo day um, mm. remotely from my studio, which sold out within a matter of hours mm. um, because, you know, we're very similar body types. And we've decided that we're going to offer another duo, but this mm. time we're doing it a much darker theme. So this fe- this theme was very light and airy, very um, bright and white. Mm. Whereas this th- this next one we're doing, um, which hasn't been released yet, so you know, a little sneak peek. Uh, yeah. The next one, yeah, <laughs> the next one's going to be very dark in theme mm-hmm. and much more um, dominant in theme, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And um, I've already I've I've spoken to a couple of photographers about it who already expressed interest in another duo, yeah. and I've said, "Here you go. This is what we're thinking. Mm-hmm. We haven't finalized plans mm-hmm. yet, nor is it advertised." And I've already sold all slots possible for that okay. studio. Mm-hmm. Um, well, it's an Airbnb, but yeah. um, they allow um, photography there. So w- the actual intent is we're going there with John for um, content purposes. And we figured, you know, the property is costing us a couple of hundred pounds mm. rather than us paying for that all out of our own pockets. Yeah. Um, we're going to work a little bit as well mm-hmm. whilst we're there. Um, and yeah, it's going to be really good. Mm. I am looking forward to that one. Well, speaking of advertising, how do you go about... Um advertising that you're doing much you've mentioned the mailing list but do you put um adverts on say purple port because i know they've started saying you can do remotes or do you find it's the facebook groups that you can get a more of a better hit rate because obviously those groups are focused for doing remote shoots i do a little bit of both actually Mm -hmm. so i'm hosting um ironically on thursday i'm hosting another newspaper shoot with a Mm -hmm. twist so this time it's entirely natural light based Mm -hmm. And I put the casting up on Purple Port and on the Facebook groups. Yeah. And within a matter of hours, it was sold out. Um, and actually, I was quite surprised that a couple of them did come from Purple Port mm-hmm. because I definitely feel that remotes have pretty much died on there. Yeah. Besides posting in the in the groups images that have been captured remotely, the vast, vast majority of my work remotely now comes from the groups, Facebook mm-hmm. groups, mm-hmm. Um, which is also strange in a way as well because I've actually connected with photographers remotely mm-hmm. and then gone on to work with them in person mm-hmm. and also now have shoots planned in advance, you know, a bit more in the future yeah. with more people from Facebook who I would probably never have come across if it wasn't for remote shooting. Yeah, because you've, you've got that first like icebreaker shoot out of the way because, so you know how each other works. And now when you work in person, it's like you've done it before exactly with the shoots what's your ideal time frame have you found like two hours is good three hours four or even god forbid like an eight hour shoot which you find is the best one has been for you um do you mean best one in terms of productivity or just best one as in terms of uh length of time to enable you to really get to know someone um i would say a little bit of both how would you find 
what's the, been uh, say like say like you've done four hours is like you feel oh I've been four hours we've done a few sets and I've got to know the photographer or do you feel it like takes uh, like an eight hour say for example that you've done a few sets but now you're thinking oh I'm tired we've done some good but no, it's really exhausted me I would probably say I think three hours to mm-hmm. four hours is the optimal time, yeah. I guess. But again, I, I really think that depends on the photographer yeah. and as a person. I'm a very chatty, outgoing person. I enjoy having just a general chit chat and mm-hmm. I like it on all shoots. Mm-hmm. I think it's really important. So even remotely, I like to have a chat. I like to say, you know, do you have any cats? You know, <laughs> we'll talk about pets. Yeah. And so I think if a photographer mm-hmm. is outgoing i think even in an hour's shoot i've when we've done our um events in the past and we we advertise those as one hour slots Mm -hmm. i feel like i've gotten to know somebody even in an hour before um and there have been other shoots that i've done and they've been i think five hours and i've gone oh i still don't really think i know very much about this photographer i still don't really think i get what they really wanted Mm -hmm. from this so to speak and i don't know whether that's just uh that we don't gel Mm -hmm. or if it's pre pre communications yeah or if it's like I say, just that um, the photographer finds it difficult to communicate yeah, over yeah. the internet, really. Thanks, Angel, for doing the podcast. Um, is there any social media or stuff you'd like to plug? Most definitely, yeah. So thank you very much for having me. No I really enjoyed it. Um, so my Purple Port account is Angel Black UK, and the same is my Instagram. It is Angel Black UK. So mm-hmm. feel free to give me a follow on either of those. I really enjoy connecting with you know, like minor creatives, whether that be model or photographer. So thank you very much again. Oh, I can hear the drink like getting... Yeah, I'm having I'm having slurps. <laughs> <laughs>